Hello again, it's Steve Smith and presentation number 17 is very much a practical pedagogy session and it's about how you might go about exploiting an easy cartoon video with uh, students who may have studied let's say three or four years of the target language. Uh, that's my blog at the bottom, frenchteachernet.blogspot.com and a reminder about informedlanguageteacher.com where there are all sorts of readings, videos and podcasts about language teaching and learning research. So, um, exploiting cartoons. Well, why would we want to do that to start with? Um, I put a list together of some thoughts on this. I mean, short cartoons uh, are certainly can be a very good source of comprehensible input. But you've got to be very careful, because even cartoons that are um, designed, let's say, for three, four, five, six-year-olds in the target language country will still feature language that is normally beyond the level of your students who've done three or four years, a good deal beyond. Um, so you've got to be careful about what you select. And, for example, on FrenchTeacher.net, I've used quite a few times um, Peppa Pig cartoons, but I wouldn't take every one of those. I have to be careful which ones I choose. You know, so they are comprehensible input, but it's, if you like, suboptimal comprehensible input. It tends to be a bit too fast. It tends to be a bit too overloaded with vocabulary and sometimes some quite low-frequency vocabulary. So when you choose your cartoons, bear in mind this is definitely what you would call roughly tuned input. You know, it's, it's input which is comprehensible, but not 90-95% comprehensible. But that doesn't mean it's not usable. But be careful how you select it and which classes you use it with, I'd suggest. Um, so why use cartoons? Well, the familiarity with the characters definitely creates interest and teachers tell me how much students enjoy using um, videos with cartoon characters they already know. Clearly it exploit, exploits the visual dimension so it makes listening um, a more edible task, shall we say, rather than just listening to a disembodied voice on an audio recording, at least you can see the interaction between characters and see characters talking and so on. Um, you can use them in class, which is what I think you'd probably do most of the time because this sort of activity needs some scaffolding and some guidance. But with some classes, you could certainly set the, the work to be done at home with the right sort of worksheets accompanying the, the source video. The great thing is, of course, that cartoons are easily uh, available online and uh, sometimes you find them uh, illegally uploaded but a lot of the big well-known cartoons have official channels so you can find high definition versions there in addition they often come with captions but it's the sort of youtube captions which are less than perfect so just bear in mind that although they're not bad there are going to be errors in there but you could choose to show the cartoons with captions Sometimes you can choose a cartoon to go with a link in the syllabus. So it might be that um, a particular topic coming up in the cartoon uh, might relate to a topic you're covering at the moment. I don't think that's a particularly big deal, really. Sometimes a lesson like this can be just a great one-off, you know, to, to do general listening with. And also some cartoons will give you cultural input. So if you've got characters, for, for example, having breakfast in a French cartoon, that might be an opportunity to deal with some um, cultural differences between your own country and the target language country. Perhaps you can think of more reasons for using cartoons. So in general, my own principles for using these, you know, what I discovered over the years using these, is that as with all work on listening texts and reading texts, my advice would be to try and work on them intensively, thoroughly, not superficially. So you can show a cartoon for fun and, and maybe do a quite a superficial language spotting exercise and have the whole thing done in 10 or 15 minutes, but that's not going to give students the chance to process the language and to build in the necessary repetition and recycling of language, that repeated input that's going to give 
give that language a chance of going into long-term memory. So, in a nutshell, you know, work intensively on shorter extracts, I would suggest, will give you the best results. So, cartoons that go over five minutes, for me, are probably too long, and ideally, if you can get down to two or three minutes, that's great. I mean, even if you just show an extract from a cartoon rather than the whole um, story, that could, that could be great, or divide it into two lessons. Clearly, you need to scaffold the process because, as I said, the language of the cartoons will be faster than you would like and will have quite a load in terms of syntax and um, vocabulary. I would suggest that you keep the focus on meaning. That's where the enjoyment will come. And but, necess but, but do encourage noticing where necessary. So if you get a repeated grammatical form being used, for example, a tense or a particular structure in the language, that might be a good opportunity to pick up uh, some grammatical forms and to map those grammatical forms against the, the meaning. But I think the main focus here is going to be on enjoyment and on meaning and on comprehension. Um, I'd, as usual, suggest that you try and stay in the target language as far as possible. Uh, but, you know, as far as possible. There can be times when it's useful to do bits of translation and exercises that involve English. A cartoon can be the basis for activities in all four skills, although clearly the main focus is going to be on listening. And you probably know by now how important I think listening is as, as one of the skills. And, of course... Uh, let's let the kids enjoy these cartoons. So a possible sort of lesson plan when you're working with something, let's say, for example, a short uh, Peppa Pig video, which you could find in different languages. Well, certainly consider a pre-listening task. Um, you know, I don't think pre-listening tasks are, you know, compulsory, but, you know, if it just whets the appetite a little bit, um, if they've already seen one of these videos, probably wouldn't even need that, but you could certainly activate some language ahead of time, even if it were, for example, choosing some adjectives and to match the adjectives with uh, characters um, in the story, or if, if they know the title of the story, perhaps to put some phrases on the board and, and get students to decide whether they're going to be relevant or ir irrelevant to the task. Um, so you can just uh, pre-activate some existing knowledge about the language and the content if you like. I played the cartoon through once, so don't turn it into a piece of work straight away. Just, just let them enjoy it. They'll pick up bits of language. They'll get the story, no doubt. Um, probably wouldn't show captions at that point either, because I think captions could be distracting. You could easily bring the captions in later on. Then once you've done that, uh, I'd then get into replaying short snippets of the cartoon intensively. And I do mean intensively, replaying them multiple times. It could actually have a slightly humorous effect for students if you take very short snippets of a few seconds and just repeat them over and over and over. And then where there are difficulties, uh, then you might repeat certain things yourself more slowly. You might use translation. You might point to captions if you're using the captions. And then really, once you've done that, you've got a whole range of exercises that you can do that encourage intensive listening together with uh, speaking and writing, for example. I think because of the nature of this input, which is less comprehensible than you might like, ideally, then it is a bit about adapting the task to the text. So what you decide to do with this particular cartoon might depend on its content. Um, so once you've worked through you know, any exercises you've chosen to do, and I'll give you some examples in a second, uh, then you'll want time for correcting and for feeding back, and then maybe some sort of post-listening exercise, if useful. I'll give you one or two suggestions about that uh, in a moment. So next, I'm going to show you some examples of uh, exercise types that you could use. You'll be familiar with some of them, maybe all of them, and perhaps you'll have your own ideas. So certainly to start with, one standard thing to do would be if you're providing a worksheet to go with the video that you might simply give them some vocabulary glossed. And you might just like to look at that and pronounce it out loud with the class before they start listening. So a very basic task, give a vocab gloss of some key words. This was a selection I took from one of my worksheets. In fact, all, all of the examples I'm going to show you in the next slides have been taken from a, a selection of worksheets from frenchteacher.net. 
Um, you can also do vocabulary to find, uh, so slightly hard, well, it demands a bit more of the students, so um, you'd, you'd give them English phrases and then they have to listen in the text and see if they can spot the, the words or chunks as they come up. Um, probably you'd put these in the order uh, that they occur in the cartoon. And you can scaffold the task, as I've done here, with uh, some letters to help and the amount of the scaffolding would depend on the class you have. Uh, another way of approaching vocab to find is by doing a matching task. Um, so classic thing here of words on the left, here are some French words, matching them with English on the right. And in a similar vein, uh, you can match chunks. So here we have on the left French chunks all taken from one particular cartoon and then they're matched here over on the right. Apologies for the way that formatting came out. So there. Uh, another really good one to do because it scaffolds the task hugely and that's to provide a, a set of sentences and students simply have to tick off any that they hear. So it's scaffolded because you're then showing them the written form um, the transcript of the cartoon. So that's giving them help, isn't it? Um, you could even give translations, I guess, on the right here if you wanted to do it as in a sort of parallel text form. And students simply tick off what they hear. Um, you might tell them in advance that only half of the sentences they're going to hear, so that'll give them an idea whether they're on the right lines in terms of how many they've ticked off. Uh, we've got a uh, classic gap fill. Uh, in this case, we've got gap fill with options. So these would be sentences they hear from the cartoon, and they have to fill in the gaps with words chosen from the box. If you wanted to make it a bit more of a challenge, you could always put in two or three distractors, i.e. words that aren't going to appear at all, and they could be in the box at the top. Um, as with all gap fill, of course, uh, you know there are ways of scaffolding it. I've done it here by s simple words, but you could do it by whole chunks. And if you didn't have the options available, you could put in, say, first word, first letters or syllables to help students. So that's the gap fill without options, which is a bit more challenging. So students don't get the help of the choices; they simply have to put in words as they hear them. And this is where you would find the relevant part of the cartoon, replay it repeatedly three, four, five times to really get their ears tuned in. Uh, and hopefully they can find any missing words. And, and if you think the, the gap you've chosen ended up being a bit too hard, then you can help them with that. Um, of course, part of your skill as, uh, as the teacher is to decide exactly where the gap should be, what you want to focus on, and how easy or difficult you want to make them. Uh, we then got um, questions in the target language. This is a higher order sort of task. So this was based on a Trotro video. Trotro is a, a little friendly donkey. And uh, in this case, it was simply a question of once they'd done other tasks on the worksheet, um, this gave them a, a slightly more challenging job to do. Uh, why is Trotro bored? What does he decide to do? What did he put in his pot? Your guess is as good as mine. And then we've got the um, correcting false statements sort of exercise. So uh, this was one from a Peppa Pig uh, video. So, for example, here's the example. Today it's the school fair, I put in village fair, students had to cross out what was wrong and put the correct alternative in. So this is involving clearly both listening and reading and a little bit of writing skill in terms of transcribing the words that they actually hear. So you can see how this is building in. Um, here three skills and once we get students reading aloud any of these of course we've got speaking involved as well my phone just went off excuse me okay um, then we've got this sort of activity um, ticking off items uh, as you hear them 
So in this case, it was a cartoon that involved, I think it was Peppa Pig going shopping, and it was a question of d deciding what was bought, what products were mentioned. So a, a tick-off exercise based on, um, here it's foodstuffs, tomato, spaghetti, ice cream, oranges, bread, etc., etc. Then we've got uh, true-false, um, of course, classic true-false. You could do true-false not mentioned. And if you want to make it more of a challenge, uh, you can do uh, true-false plus translate the sentence in each case. Or another alternative is to correct the false statements as well as identify the true ones. There's some uh, standard gap fill where I've uh, given parts of words here. And so they're just basically completing words. You could choose to focus on aspects of words you think are a certain, where there's a certain challenge. For example, in French, you've got issues to do with phonics, sound, spelling, relationships. So again, it's not random gaps here. You're going to get them to focus on the areas of words you think are important. Then we've got this sort of thing, a reordering exercise. So here, uh, we have a whole bunch of statements, so the one in quotation marks are things that characters actually say as part of the dialogue. The ones without quotation marks are the narrator's um, dialogue, sorry, the, the narration, beg your pardon. And then it's simply a question of spotting which order they come in and putting them in order. So you put numbers next to them, one, two, three, four, five, etc. And uh, apologies again for the layout of this, but this is a tick off and translate. So in this case, this came actually from a different video. It wasn't a, car a, a different video, not a cartoon one, but these were words and chunks to do with jobs uh, that were mentioned. And so they had to tick off the jobs and give a translation. You can also do a uh, translation into the target language. So. Uh, these were phrases translated from the original. I think this was Peppa Pig here. And you, Dad, what did you, what did you want to do when you were little? They can get the answer from uh, the video. And then once you've done um, worked on the cartoon intensively, then you could do other things. You could display a written summary of the story that you wrote. And then once you've got a text on the screen or printed, you've got your usual sort of array of tasks you can do with the written text, you know, in terms of you reading aloud, students reading aloud, um, disappearing text, which I've described to you before, where you take chunks out of the text slide by slide, uh, classic question answer and similar drills, uh, correcting false statements, and you can give students a gapped template to do. You can also do hour or gap fill, where once you've showed them the text, then you take away the text, you uh, give part of a sentence, and the class has to complete it orally or even on paper. And you could do a vocabulary test, couldn't you? Once you've covered chunks and words from the cartoon, then you could revisit them another time. And I'm not suggesting that you do this all in one lesson, of course. You know, it's the sort of thing where you might do part of it in one lesson and then come back to it in another lesson. All depends on your class. So I hope you've got an idea of how intensively you can work on a short uh, cartoon. And uh, I hope you found that interesting and informative. And uh, next session, by the way, I'm going to be talking about how you might use uh, a single picture for advanced storytelling. And in the meantime, uh, just a mention, as usual, for my book, Becoming an Outstanding Languages Teacher, and my books, The Gianfranco Conti, Breaking the Sound Barrier and the Language Teacher Toolkit. Thanks very much for listening in again. Hope to see you again. Bye.